I begin, I would like to acknowledge the Wajak Noongar as the traditional owners of the land we stand on today, but I also want to acknowledge the Nanda and um, Malgana people as the traditional owners of the land uh, this study is conducted on. We all know um, habitat disturbance is a significant threat to our wildlife. We can see from these photos on the screen in cropped and livestock impacted landscapes that there is a lack of cover, a lack of habitat complexity, and overall a lack of um, refuge availability. And as we all know, this can have an interactive effect with our feral cats. They can really benefit from this landscape. It's more simple, it's easy for them to move through and more successful at hunting. Now we've heard throughout this conference that there's a lot of amazing research and management into these effects, but what if we could actually start to address these two issues at the same time and improve our wildlife's ability to both detect and avoid predators in this landscape? And that is where artificial refuges come into the mix. So without repeating Darcy too much, artificial refuges are human-made materials that aim to replace shelter that has been lost. Typically when I talk about that, a lot of people think of artificial hollows or nest boxes, but I'm actually targeting ground dwelling species. And there's a lack of science in artificial refuges, particularly for ground dwelling species. And this is where we need to start closing the knowledge gap if we're wanting to use them as a management tool. So my whole PhD is looking at whether artificial refuges for small mammal and reptile species can reduce feral cat predation in disturbed landscapes. From these images, you can see that animals are starting to use um, these refuges. My highlight so far is the top right one here. Might look like a little bit of a blob, but it's actually a dunna carrying two bubs on her back, the poor thing. Um, but this then poses the question as to whether it can actually congregate cat activity to these refuges and be a predation risk. So this early chapter of my PhD is looking at feral cat activity at artificial refuges. I wanted to see if cat activity was different between cleared and intact landscapes, and if they were different between the different refuge types. So I'm really fortunate enough to be in partnership with Bush Heritage Australia. I am working on two reserves, but today we're gonna to be talking about Uradi Reserve. I am sincerely, sorry, Gilly. Um, this is a 30,000 hectare reserve located in the Midwest region of WA, approximately an hour and a half from Geraldton, and a small portion of the reserve was cleared for cropping in the 1970s, and that small image there is the area that was cleared. So because I wanted to compare intact versus cleared landscapes, I set up four paired sites. At each site, I had two treatments, one in the cleared red zone there, which is the cleared red soil, and this was paired with an adjacent intact York Gum Woodland site, approximately 350 metres away in that green section there. I could talk to you guys forever about the choices of and how I chose these refuges, but I went with refuges that were easily accessible, recyclable and easily deployable. So reserve managers, uh, property owners or members of the public can easily replicate this and deploy it at a large scale. So within each of my treatment sites, I had four plots, one for each artificial refuge type and one control where no refuge was deployed. And these were deployed in a grid formation separated by 50 metres from each plot. I had forward facing cameras approximately five metres away um, from the refuges to monitor cat activity and these were unbaited. So before I could really go into cat activity, I wanted to describe what activity these cats were doing. I developed an ethogram based off Stanton and others' standardised ethogram for Philidae. An ethogram is essentially a table that describes animal behaviour, so it's consistent when you're going through and scoring um, your photos. And then I grouped them into three different behaviour categories. So first we have walk past behaviour, where the cats are cruising on through, they're not really paying any attention to anything, they're just walking past um, the field or frame. Interacting behaviour is where they're actually doing a bit more interacting within the plot or at the refuge, so they're climbing, so the image below is a mum climbing the pole, but also a kitten underneath looking at mum like, what are you doing, there's a camera there. We also have lying behaviours, scent marking, which is probably not the best thing to see on a camera for those of us that have been so lucky to witness it. And then we have investigating behaviour. So this is where they're actually directly interested with it, something within the plot or at the artificial refuges. They're entering, attempting to enter the refuges. They've got full focus on, some, on the refuge or they're sniffing. They're just trying to see what's within the refuge. Now, hopefully this video plays. Awesome, cool. So 
as many of you who have dealt with uh, camera traps, you would probably get two, three, four hundred photos of cats doing the same thing. This is a cat and her kitten um, playing at one of my pallets. So to not count this cat 300 times for my analysis, I set an independence time interval of 10 minutes. So each individual detection was separated by 10 minutes. And if you have cats at home and you don't want to spend hundreds of dollars on toys, get a pallet off the side of the road, <laughs> slap some takeoff on it, boom, free kitty play area. I just ask that these results do not get posted anywhere um, because it is still um, early in this analysis and I've still got data to collect. But first, if we look at the treatment, so is there a difference in cat activity between cleared versus intact landscapes? And if we look at the number of independent events, we can see that there's no real difference in cat activity between the two treatment sites. They're mostly walking around, a little bit of interacting, oh boy, a um, little bit of investigating, but overall there's no real difference. If we then look at the behaviour budget, so how much time are they actually spending doing that behaviour? Are they spending more time interacting or are they spending more time walking past? We can see again that there's not really a difference between activity. And this was interesting to me because I did expect to see more activity occurring in those cleared sites where they're more open and easily um, preferred for cats. But overall, there was no difference so far. Now, quickly for the refuges, for the sake of time and confusion, I will be comparing control to each individual refuge type. But the number of detections, we can see most of the detections involve cats just cruising on through. If we then compare that to our logs, we can see that there is less detection of cats walking past and more detections of cats starting to interact and investigate with those log pile refuges. Next, we have our corrugated iron sheet. Similar pattern showing less um, or more investigating and interacting detections occurring. And pallets, the good old pallets, there's a lot of interacting and a lot of investigating behaviour occurring at the pallet refuges. If we then look at how much time they're spending doing that behaviour, we can see that almost 100% of the time they're just walking past the control zone or control plot. Makes sense, there's not really much of them to integrate or interact with, sorry, or anything of them attracting them to the area. Compared to our logs, we can see that they're spending less time walking and more time investigating log refuges. And a similar trend again with corrugated iron with more interacting, investigating behaviour occurring at our iron sheets. And then there's pallets. There's a lot more investigating behaviour and interacting behaviour happening at the pallets. And this could be because more animals are attracted to the pallets, but also the complexity of the pallets is not really Big. It's a lot easier for the cats to look and enter the refuges compared to the other two, so that might make it easier or more interesting for them to investigate. So in conclusion, um, there's more cat activity occurring at our artificial refuges, and this is interesting to know because it could pose an ecological trap for our wildlife. Are we congregating our animals to these areas just to be a free feed for our, for our feral cats? Although with science, this asks more questions than it does answers. For example, does this affect wildlife's use of artificial refuges? Are they avoiding pallets because there's more cat activity occurring? Or does the benefit of having these refuges where they are lacking outweigh that risk of predation? And that is what I am continuing to explore with my PhD. I'll be continuing to monitor cat and species use of refuges, as well as investigating predation risk. So how safe do our wildlife feel at these refuges and understand behaviourally why they may or may not be using them? And I would love to start using um, GPS collars and do similar to what Catherine Mosby has done and look at cat movement around refuges. Because with cameras, I can just see what's in front of me, but there might be a cat sitting stalking next to the camera that I can just not see at that time. But that is it from me. Um, yeah, if anyone wants to come have a chat, feel free. If not, that's my email. Bye.